So here we are making the system bootable. And first thing we'll to do is to create a FS tab file so that the system knows what partitions to mount at boot time. So we'll need to, let's quickly first of all just look at our disk layout to remind us. So the boot disk is dev SDA and the two partitions we've got is SDA1 is the swap and SDA2 is the root file system. So now we've reminded ourselves of that. We can do VI etc fs tab and the first line it's got here is the root file system so we type in here slash dev slash sda oops sda2 because that's the root file system I need to specify what type of file system is on there we formatted it to x4 and then the second line is for the swap partition that's obviously on sta1 The mount point is called swap, so we leave that as it is, and the rest of it we leave as it is. And these other virtual file systems we leave as well, because they'll get mounted ready for us at boot time. Now, if you like, you can specify or refer to the partitions you want to mount using the UUID. Um, going to leave mine as dev sda1 and 2 because that's what the book says but if you want to be a bit adventurous you can use block id slash dev slash sda question mark and what you do is to copy this uuid and replace the dev sda and fs tab with that long string of numbers so that's the only problem with using this method so dev sda was a swap you just replace oops, this information here with that information in fact I'm not sure if the quotes are optional or not I've never used the quotes but it looks like it's not complaining about that with the color highlighting um, but normally I just use that um, and that's that means that if the um, partition gets moved around on the disk, uh, the UUID will always remain the same. Um, if you create other partitions and SDA1 became SDA2 for whatever reason, um, or indeed if the disk itself got booted and became SDB for some reason, for example, you booted with a, a USB stick in, in the machines and that, and that became SDA, your hard disk will become SDB. By using the UUID, it will always be able to find that partition ir irrespective of what um, the UDEV uh, utility has given to that block device. So it can be um, easier to boot with this. It's just a bit awkward. As you can see, the, the tabulation of the layout of the FS tab file is um, messed up a little bit because of that long string so as I say I won't be using this because the book doesn't I'll just stick with the old method I'll just quit that with Q uh, exclamation mark so I'll just show again that I've gone back to the old way of doing it um, with the SDA 1 and 2 but apart from that that's complete there's more information there about um, Uh, co-pages and so on and there's some information here about um, adding barrier 1 if necessary uh, for EXT file systems. So now we move on to the Linux kernel and building the Linux kernel. So I need to go back to my sources directory and the first thing we need to do is to extract the contents of the tarball associated with the Linux kernel. So change into the directory as usual and the first command we've got to run is make proper which as it says it ensures the source tree is absolutely clean. It's recommended by the kernel team. 
Now, uh, as it also says, there's several ways to configure the kernel. There's several, several config commands. If you've got an existing kernel you can use, you can copy that in and make sure that the file you copy into here is called .config because that's the default name of the config file that the kernel uses. You then need to run make old config to ensure that that config file is brought up to the same version as the current one we're going to be building. Um, I'm going to assume that you haven't got a kernel configuration file. The best way to proceed from here without one is to run uh, a def config target and what that does it creates a reasonable default config with most options um, enabled, uh, most popular drivers enabled as modules. Um, it's the easiest thing to do. The downside is it, it compiles a lot of stuff in that you probably never ever need so you may want to go through the kernel and, and remove things you know you don't want but the advantage is it creates a kernel that should work in most cases and should enable most devices so it's a good initial option to start with. If you do need to go back and make any changes then you can use this command here make menu config and you get a nice um, uh, graphical display. The colours are a bit dodgy on this uh, Endeavor OS unfortunately. They're, they've sort of muted the colours and made, made them sort of purpley bluey set of colours to go with their theme so they're a bit odd on this but they're still reasonably legible but as you can see there's a menu system here and you can go in and modify stuff so I'm not going to make any changes here because I don't need to. Oh, apart from checking these options here, I forgot about this. Um, so I'm going to go back in and just check these. And all you need to do is just follow this down. So you need to look for the first option, which is device drivers. And that's down here. So you just highlight it with the cursor key, press enter. Then we need to look for one called generic driver options. So we'll look for that. And it's just a little bit wet. Oops. Just a little bit way down here, press enter to go into that menu. And we need to make sure that support for Uvent Helper is not selected. It isn't, see it's blank. And maintain a dev temp fs file system is selected, which it is. That's the next option there. If you are booting with UEFI, as I've said at the beginning of this, I'm not. But if you are, you need to make sure that this option here is selected under process type and features from the main menu. There is a hint there in the Linux from scratch hints. Um, it's a little bit out of date the last time I looked at it. I don't know if it has been updated. The package versions, uh, yes, it does look like it's been updated about oh, two years ago now. Um, I th think, I can't remember the last time I updated it, but certainly the package versions were out of date. Um, Grub 204, I think that's the latest version we're using. Um, so you may have to be prepared to... Uh, yeah, it does look a bit different, actually. Um, yeah, it may be okay, as it is, actually. But be prepared to... Um, make some changes to get it to work with um, the current version of Linux from scratch. It might. It is only a hint. It's not a uh, explicit instructions. It's more of a guide. So as I say, be prepared to make some little tweaks or changes to get it to work. Um, if you want to see how I've done it, um, I've built. Linux from scratch with UEFI once um, with this playlist here. If I do beautiful playlist, it's this one here Linux from scratch 9.0 on Ubuntu with um, System D as well and EFI. So that one of these videos I do go through showing you how to do that so you can 
follow that again you can see it's a little bit old now um, you might need to update um, some of the packages um, I do use that hint as a guide but I don't explicitly follow it word for word so um, it's there to be followed like I say I've gone for the default just to make it easier if you've never built it before it's simpler rather than to have to risk doing stuff you might not be aware about so apart oops apart from that um, I'll come out of this menu and there's no changes there just run make I'll time this because this will take a few minutes um, I can't remember if the make flags is honored when you're building the kernel I'll try it without Let me open a new tab and get top up and monitor it Uh, yes, it does look like it is using all of them, so that's okay. I can leave that running as it is and come back when it's finished.
Okay, that kernel's been built. So the next thing we need to do is to install the modules that have been compiled. And then, um, what was the caution? If the host system is a separate boot partition, the files copy below should go there. Okay, so we haven't got a separate boot because I wanted to make this as simple as possible. So, um, because of that, of that, the kernel files just go straight into the root file system. So we can copy these straight away. If you did decide to use a separate boot, then you'd need to run this command as it says here in the host system so that that boot partition is available within the troot. So this command copies the kernel to the boot directory, copy the system map and also take a copy of the config file install some documentation for the kernel and now there's um, a note about ensuring that the um, contents of the kernel or sorry the source um, files of the kernel are owned by root um, basically because of a security issue that the idea of the person who packaged the file could allow somebody with the same ID to gain access to these files so that's the idea behind this so I'll run this command on the Linux directory that we're in and ideally I suppose I should re-enter the directory to take those changes Um, there's a bit here about warning about creating a sim link um, in the traditional way of user source is recommended not to do that and a bit there about the headers if you need to load have modules loaded in a certain order it tells you how to do that here next need to set up the grub to allow the actual machine to boot the disk. Um, this first bit um, I've never found it really useful because you need a host Linux from scratch to boot from unless you, you're booting from your own machine um, well I guess even then you'd still have access to the partition that you've been building from so whether it's from an existing um, Linux system you've got on the disk or a live CD or USB whatever um, so I've, I've never done this because I couldn't see the point of it but you're welcome to create your own separate disk if you wish to it means you need to go into the BLFS to install this lib iso burn package to allow you to run this command here to create an iso which you can burn um, so that that's just optional in my opinion um, if, you, if the system doesn't boot and you do need to go in just uh, boot your live CD, your live USB, uh, mount the virtual file systems, do the true commands and get back into the system that way um, and then make any modifications you need to make to get it to boot. Some information there about how Grub names things. Um, so partition 1 on the first disk, the first disk is indexed from 0 but the partitions are indexed from 1 so the first disk is, is zero, the first partition is one. So it's worth bearing in mind. And also that Grub doesn't consider CD-ROMs to be hard drives, so they're skipped. So there's a warning here. If I run this command, it's going to modify the boot record of the first disk. As I've only got one disk, it's not going to cause any harm. So I can run it without fear, but if... Uh, and also double check that the disk designation that you're um, going to install this because it will overwrite the boot sector. Um, why has that done that? Oh right, okay. If the system's been booted using UEFI, 
Right, okay, so that's what's happened here. Because I've booted with UFI, I need to add this minus minus target i386PC to get it to boot in the traditional way. And there you go, that's installed now. So I need to create a um, grub config file. So all I'll do to start off with is just to add that in. And now I'm going to modify that. So it's the boot, grub, okay, one will do, grub.cfg, and the bits that are important to change, um, as it says here, in fact it doesn't tell you which bits to change, no it doesn't, the root is the root partition. So if you remember, my first partition was the swap file, so that would be HD01, and my root file system is in fact HD02. So remember, HD0 is the first disk, which is SDA. Partition 1 and 2, partition 1 is a swap, partition 2 is the root file system. So that's exactly right, I don't need to make any changes. Likewise, we've got to tell the kernel what... So this, this line here tells grub where the root file system is and this root command here tells the kernel where the root file system is and again it's already set to the correct partition SDA2 so I'm lucky in this case I don't need to make any changes at all so I'll just quit that um, I can run fdisk-l on SDA just to confirm that And as you can see, SDA is the root file system. It's the bigger of the two partitions, bigger by a lot. 